Pixie. I'm Sam. And, and I'm Byrus Sam. And you're listening to Nerd Talk, where I talk over our third contributor and host person. And it's 2010. 2012, stupid. <laughs> I've traveled through time. Years go forward, not backwards. <laughs> I need to find the doctor. I'm in the wrong place. But continuing, it's 2012, and welcome to Nerd Talk. It's a fine Monday, January the 3rd. It's Tuesday! <laughs> <laughs> time traveling issues. <laughs> Actually, it's just been so long since I actually worked, I'm completely oblivious to the date and time. What day have we been doing the show on for the last two years? Look, I didn't even know what year I was in, so, like, if it's 2010, we shouldn't be here. Lay sigh. Yup. So, yeah, it's a fine Tuesday, January the 3rd, 2012. Might as well give the right date once. And we're here for Nerd Talk. Tonight, we're reviewing this lovely little box that we have here. Sorry for people who are listening, uh, just listening and not watching our video, which you should totally check out on our website, nerdtalkshow.com. We'll be reviewing this, Super Dungeon Explorer, because it's been a long time since we've reviewed something that wasn't electronic. <clears throat> it's box. I also, over the weekend, saw Limitless. So I'll okay. talk about that just a little bit. We've, we've been meaning to see that for quite some time, haven't we, Sam? That's been on Netflix for like a month, so I saw it already. Ah. So I can talk about Limitless 2. Also. In addition. What? Bird salad? Yep. Uh, hair's not cooperating. Anyway. Watch Pixie play with her hair tonight on Nerd Talk. Well, tomorrow on Nerd Talk. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. The video post takes a while. The but yeah, takes so a little bit. what would we like to leave with this fine evening? Oh, we also have a bit of comedy towards the end of the show. We are going to give our proposed Old Republic achievements. Because it doesn't have Because that. Bioware hasn't gotten around to implementing them yet. You know, they were doing important things like adding story, quest incentives. Um, <laughs> and making it so that the sell game. vendor trash button doesn't work. It has worked for me every single time. Just saying. Yeah, it's... It, it seems to be working now. No, seriously, this is going to be driving me crazy the entire yeah, the, show. The only glitch I'm having in-game is that occasionally my companions are like, hey, I want to talk to you about something. And I'm like, okay, let's head for the ship. And then it's I get like, there and nope, they're like, never mind. no, that's fine. Like, things my character would punish his companions for. Actually, I don't time. think we've talked about this on the show yet. I ran into a glitch, and Pixie can corroborate me on this, where the final boss of my first chapter wouldn't spawn. At the end of a long and arduous instance, you just That's get to the end after you fought your way through, and the boss just wouldn't be there. And the quest marker would be like, hey, fight this guy. And you'd be like, shrug, IDK. No, he was there the whole time. He was just invisible. No, no it, it was not there at all. And so we ran, this dun we ran this instance, I think, three times before he showed yep. up. All right, then. It took a long time, and I was like, <laughs> the entire way. Yeah, I, I had to do a class quest where I was supposed to go to this pool on Tatooine and look into the pool and, like, a vision of me came out and I had to fight it, kind of like uh, uh, Dagobah. So I fight the guy, and he, like, gives me advice that, like, quit being a light-sided Sith, you're supposed to be dark, you're gonna get betrayed and fail if you keep being a nice guy. And after I beat him, like, he's supposed to walk into you because he's giving you his insights, but immediately after the quest, he's still just standing there. I'm like, hi, me that was supposed to disappear. Oh, well. Um, so, yeah, I guess we should jump into Super Dungeon Explorer, because it's right in front of us. Super Dungeon Explorer is a tabletop miniature role-playing game where you kill dragons. Yep, it's released by both Cool Mini or Not, the painter's uh, website of choice, and Soda Pop Miniatures, often known for their anime-inspired sexy lady miniatures. You can look those up at their website. Uh, I believe it is sodapopminiatures.com. So, right off from the box, you can tell exactly what the game is for. This is an old-fashioned dungeon romp, uh, right out of the Super Nintendo era of gaming. Uh, it's supposed to represent kind of like the D&D arcade game, where you're just side-scrolling through a dungeon, beating things up. The goal of the game is to destroy the monster spawners while going through the dungeon, and then eventually take down the dungeon boss. <clears throat> Sounds like Gauntlet. Is there yeah. food? Can you say that Wizard needs food badly? Uh, you can say Wizard needs potion badly, but there Dang is no it. actual food. So the rule book, <laughs> while being very colorful yeah, and high-gloss paper... It, it's a nice rule book to look at, 
but it's actually rather useless, and so you can see we've printed off someone else's clarifications of the, some of the rules off of the internet. Yeah, we found a forum post on Warseer, and uh, thanks to the guy who made this, but it is... Did you remember his username at all? No, I didn't copy that part. But, uh, yeah, this is totally a much better summary of the rules. And it's not made up or anything. He does reassure the readers that all of these rules are in the main rulebook. And it's I, only four pages, not yeah. even. I tried to decipher this 31-page rulebook for the better part of two days to get the rules of this game and still was having clarification questions on everything. I was like, so does that mean this? I, I, this is a brand new game, right? It hadn't come out when we initially talked with the makers of it at Gen Con. Yeah, yep. no, the, the game had not been released yet. They were having printing problems uh, in China when uh, when we had t seen it at Gen Con. So they Maybe got, they'll at the rush time out they a second gotten, edition with a revised manual that this makes sense. Oh. than cardboard. Yeah, that, that's definitely uh, cardstock, like yeah, really thick cardstock. Like so at least you don't have to worry about the game boards like breaking down over time, because this is nice stuff. This is stuff. tough stuff. I mean, right it's here. nicely colored. So this little thing is that the... Nice this is the console. Uh, tray console being a, you know, double kind of word play. Since you are playing as the the game machine in this, when you're playing as the evil characters, so you've got two different stacks for both loot and treasure, which you earn throughout the game to get attached to your heroes. Adventure effects that affect the entire dungeon, <clears throat> and your power tracker up. and your loot tracker. As well, you're being Vanna White here. I'm trying to actually like be useful. Yep. Um, the, so you got treasure cards. So, which are the nicer treasures in the game. And so there'll be like treasure chests like sitting on little squares and when you open one up there's like, hey, there's some loot here. It's a treasure. I'll okay. leave that there for the camera. So there's rooms and stuff. They like buff your characters. And so, then there's loot which you can equip to certain slots. There are little gem, um, little pictures of gems on each side of the card. And those are the slots that certain items can be equipped in. So let's see if I find a loot card here. Or do you have all the loot cards? They're all in there. Oh, Should oh, be okay. in there. Okay, so here's a loot card. Uh, this one's a green one. And so it would go on the green side. Yep. So each character can equip up to so. four items in their given slots. It, it works a lot like one of those old school Super Nintendo games that it intends to emulate. You know, you, you found this loot who gets to equip it, and then it's locked on that character. Mm -hmm. um, the game utilizes mm -hmm. unique dice, so you can't just use generic D6s for this. So it has blue dice, which have a number of stars and other symbols on them. I believe the blue dice actually has a heart. Um, yeah, the, the blue die has, let's see, two ones, two sides that have ones on them, one side that has two stars on them, uh, a couple of blanks, and then a heart. Yep. Then you have the red die, which is a little bit better. It's balanced more in the favor. Uh, it has two ones, a two, and a three, as well as a potion side. I'll show you what the potion looks like. There we are. And the best die in the game, which is the green die. The green die, which just does monstrous things to people when you get it. So this side actually has no blanks. But and it operates a little bit more like a true d6, just a yep. little bit. Yep, the highest that it goes, it's one, two, three, or four. It actually has two two sides. And then the sixth side is both a potion and a heart. The way the game works is that when you want to attack someone, say if I've got my little hero, I'll get uh, the painted one out of the box. Actually painted ones, we've got two now. This is the paladin hero that comes in the box. I'll hold him a little closer there, there you can see. There he goes, camera even focused on him and everything. Cover the face. So that's our paladin hero. When he wants to attack something, his card will tell me how many of these dice I get to roll. Uh, it'll also get modified by whatever he's equipping. And I'm going to compare that with whatever I'm attacking's defense, and I need to roll higher than its defense in order to, to do a wound to it. And the most wounds that any basic attack will ever do is one. Most monsters only have one wound. But when I destroy a monster, I get to advance the power tracker by one on the console card, which kind of ups the scale of the game. It makes things harder. And I get to advance the loot tracker one, and every hero gets to do that. When you hit the loot icon, you get to draw a loot card, which you can either use that for equipment for your characters, or you can turn that into a spiffy little potion for yourself, 
or you can use it to heal yourself. So at least the game gives you lots of different options. You never feel like you're just stuck in a corner because of the randomness of things happening. Here's the sorceress hero that got painted up by Luca for us. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. these miniatures are pretty good looking. Like yeah. here, they come not very assembled and they take a while to build. No, part of having a cool, cool mini or not produce this game is that th this is definitely a game that is designed for people who like miniature games. Like, if you expect something straight out of the box like a Monopoly, you are going to be sorely disappointed with this game. Uh, it's kind of on the expensive side, being that it retails for $90. But you get over 50 models in this box. I forget the exact number. It's between 50 and 60. Oh, that's their fire strike wings. Don't I don't attach them. Uh, to put them in the box, I, I just don't put the dragon's wings on. There's that. Pixie is currently assembling the boss character, Starfire the Dragon. The dragon's name is Starfire. We're not making that up. I'm holding closer to the camera. Wee. Man, Rah. I don't want to go watch Teen it's Titans. Dragon. Yep. Dragon. So, <laughs> the game comes with eight heroes, including the druid's alternate form. So, so the druid can shapeshift into an angry bear. Yeah, which the bear miniature is one of the larger models in the game. It is actually super cool. And it's not painted right now. <clears throat> not painted at the moment. <clears throat> I'm digging out the heroes at the moment so that we can go through them and list. So if I recall co correctly, I believe you got a t-shirt with your order. Although that may have been a pre-order bonus. Yeah, that was a pre-order bonus. Uh, for pre-ordering at Gen Con, they handed me an extra large Super Dungeon Explorer Let's Party t-shirt. There's all the heroes set up. Alright, so we've got these things, which come in the box. These are the spawn points. Pixie's already made a note of how phallic they appear. The, these are used to bring monsters into the game and serve as the objective for the two-player game. Uh, the two-player version of the game is called 8-bit mode. Uh, the hero's party will only have two characters in it. Uh, the enemy will always receive one spawn point for each hero on the board. And in the two-player version of the game, the objective is just to destroy both spawn points. And the biggest enemy that the uh, console can spawn is this mini-boss here, named Rex. In, in the larger versions of the game, the console can actually spawn up to two of these at a time. Rex is big, he hits things, and he cuddles, which is great. Part of the draw of the game is that every character has some uh, neat little flavorful text on them, or some ability that's just full of character. Characterful, if you will. So, how many so people are going to be playing a game, the champs, and how are their teams going to be? You called them champs. Somebody's hey. been playing League. So much League. Okay, so I guess we'll start with the Paladin. Who has been in every game we have played so far. I'll hold his card up close there. Yep, the Royal Paladin. Haven't named He's any of these guys yet. He's one of the game's humans, and we've got ours painted with fine silver armor, a nice blue cape, and a, a white, holy-looking shield. And so he's got a couple things he can do. He's got the Iron Halo, which is a buff. It's got a range of three, uh, which adds one blue die to any allies' um, so he, armor. Board. He makes everyone a little harder to hurt, which is good, because certainly when you start stacking that with armor and abilities, it makes your guys kind of crazy. And then he's also got an attack ability called Smite, which adds one red die to his attack roll. And if it does hit, hit, it causes the knockdown and fire effects. So your enemy will fall down and then burn. His potion ability heals three and has the remedy keyword, which means it removes all status effects, yep. like being on fire. Oh, we, we didn't mention that. Um, every character carries potions on them. Uh, the number of potions that they start the game with is listed on their ca uh, card. A couple characters start with more than one. Um, you can have an unlimited number of potions on your character at any given time. but uh, Infinity RPG pockets, you know. Yeah, you know. You just have a potion, you get the little times how many next to your character. Like this one? Yep. Um, all of the heroes in the game have five wounds as their basic stat. Um, so if they take five hits from a normal damage source, they will die. The advantage being that the... Party has lots of different ways to heal as long as you're rolling properly, and even some characters in the game can just heal. 
So taking the Paladin in a small game is always a good idea because he can heal while doing other roles. Um, so next up on our list of characters, we're going to cover the other painted oh, sure. one that we've got. It's going to make me have to dig for the cards. So, hold on. Real yeah. quick, how many players are going to be playing a game, and what are their teams going to be? Okay, uh, on average, the Let's the 8-bit version of the game means you have two heroes, which we found that you can play that with three people because one person's going to be taking the role of the console, and you've got one person for each of the heroes. Or you can do it with one person playing the console and the other person just playing as both of the heroes. Which we've done as well. Yeah, so we've done both of those. Um, then there's the 16-bit version of the game, which is kind of the recommended form of the game. This is where you have three heroes and a console player. So, again, you could do this with two people. Just have one person running all of the heroes and one person running the console. But I found that it's more fun if you essentially play it like you handle uh, D&D, where you've got one person representing each hero and then a person representing the console. Kind of Those time data. estimates sound really quick. Did the games actually go that fast? We had our five-player version of the game, which is the super mode of the game, where we had we had five or no, we had four players in that one because you were playing two characters. I was playing two. That lasted uh, two hours. Oh, so that's that's pretty long. That's yeah. what I would expect. And we were and we were trying to speed through the thing too. We yeah, were trying the, to power the rules it. actually really let you go quickly if you uh, understand them. And after two failed sessions, uh, we we understood the rules well enough to get through. Two hours is a good amount of time. That's a balance between well, we're done and now we need something else to do, and getting in a fist fight with Grandma at three a.m. because the game never ends. Well, I've also found that you can you can mix what you're playing if you say do one of the three-player games and are like, well, that was a lot of fun, but we don't have time to play another three-person, you can step it down and go to the two-person version. Uh, the two-person version of the game only lasts about 30 minutes, and the three-player lasts between 45 and an hour. It's just when you, when you step it up to the five-person version, you're adding a lot of stuff to the board. And the dungeon boss doesn't even spawn until you go all the way through the power tracker a second time because of how much stuff is coming on the board. So I guess we'll continue on to the other champions. Um, here, one of Pixie's favorites so far, who's partially painted, at least her hair is. Um, the Claw Tribe Barbarian. Interesting little lady. So she's kind of the game's berserker. She has a rage ability that lets her attack every time she moves a square. After every square you move this turn, immediately make one melee attack. But it's at the cost of her armor, which goes down afterwards. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we mentioned the sorceress. Yep, we already talked about the sorceress a little bit. Um, she is what makes boss fights super easy, because she is just going to use one of her three debuffs to make the boss super weak, and then let the rest of the party just kill it like it was a normal monster. Mm -hmm. So that that was the bane of uh, my five-player game. I would spawn a Rex, and she would go, and then Rex would not be able to hurt anything. You've also got the Glimmer Dusk Ranger, who's an elf. The elf archer character. So we're, we're going off of these classic fantasy archetypes here. She's partially painted. Her job is to just shoot things at range. She's very accurate, she's very good at what she does. Um, so, she's one of the few characters in the game that gets a base attack of two reds. Mm -hmm. And at any time can upgrade that so that she gets uh, plus one blue. With her potion ability. Mm -hmm. How hard is this game going to be? How often are the players going to win and the monsters going to win? Uh, We've never had the players lose. Yeah, so far we have only seen the monsters uh, lose. I think mainly it's because I haven't been making proper monster compositions. Playing... Playing the console is a lot harder than playing the heroes because I have to keep track of all of my player or all of my creatures' different abilities and how they interact. Also, we've only got to spawn the dragon once. We only did one five-player version of the game, mm -hmm. and uh, with the adventure party that that had been put together, it was very hard for the monsters to do well. So I think in the case of the five-player game, it all comes down to how good of a group. Does the we also had some really pick. lucky item draws, though. 
Yeah, we, we had effectively a support character the entire game whose only job was to spend her turn walking around giving potions to people, giving extra actions to people, and healing people. We'll talk about her in just a minute. Um, next up, we have the Devilkin Rogue. Riffling Rogue. Just like a tiefling. Yeah, she's a little tiefling rogue. Her job is to just do an insane amount of damage in melee combat and then disappear. One of her abilities is called Bamf. Yep. She teleports. And she's got the backstab ability, which actually adds a green dice to her and lets her do two wounds at once. Uh, we've also got another character with an interesting element, the Deep Root Druid. Yep. Shape shifts into the angry bear. Yeah, the druid is kind of the character you pick if you're not sure what you want to do. So just like a wow druid, he can either be a healer in his normal form, or he can decide, I'm going to transform into a bear. At which point he is a melee DPS character. Who is incredibly hard to hurt. And then his potion ability gives all, he all uh, heroes the healer keyword, and so, I mean, he can do every roll, basically, yep. a little bit. Yeah, he does everything. He can he can do range damage with his Stranglethorn ability. He can heal. He can turn into a DPS one. character. Yeah, no one's actually grabbed him yet, which kind of surprised me. Like, I was expecting someone to totally This doesn't surprise you, though. No, oddly enough, the one character we found in the game who seems to be a dud is the dwarf, the Hearthsworn Fighter. Who does have a decent model, I'll say. He, he looks neat. Um... He's one of the characters that actually has a weird attack that targets a stat other than defense. And he does it in a wave. The Dwarven Curse. So, not only does it pull targets into his range, it also targets their willpower uh, rather than their basic stats. So, like, the, the little guys, the, the just minions, are going to fall for this every time. So his strategy is actually to pull in all the enemies using this, and then to attack with his cleave ability, which hits everything immediately in front of him. Mm -hmm. So, it, it seems he has a point. And he is the only character model in the game that has six wounds as his base uh, health. Mm -hmm. But the other characters are frankly cooler. He doesn't have any special abilities. He's immune to poison and knockdown, though, being a dwarf. Dwarves don't fall over much, I guess. <clears throat> uh, the Ember Mage. Who's kind nice. of your AoE spellcaster. Yep. She blows things up. She also has the White Mage Potion, which heals everyone around her for one. Which is kind of cool. And then this one you had to buy separately, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yep, there is the special support character, uh, Candy and Cola, who is a metal miniature. This is the the spokes character for Soda Pop Miniatures. She's kind of always with them. She, I think she's in every one of their games. Uh, she was a, an exclusive limited edition release for pre-ordering the game that I actually ended up finding on a shelf at our local game store. So I ended up And then you were up. like, well, guess I'll buy it. Yeah, because that was the only thing I was missing from my pre-order, which got cancelled. So Candy is one of the weirdest characters in the game in that she has this ability called Vending Machine, where at the start of the turn, she randomly rolls a dice to just gain potions. Actually, that would be her, blue die. her cola ability. Yeah, she rolls a blue die and gets that many potions, which it never came up on too, I believe. Nope. Uh, she, she's also the only character that can pass a potion to another character once she has it. She can just toss a potion up to six squares away to another person. Just like, yeah, you get a potion, you get a potion, you get a potion. She's also got the ridiculously powerful ability to uh, give someone sugar rush. By consuming three potions, she can give them two additional actions in a turn. Mm. Which is kind of crazy. Yeah, Th this character is the best support in the game, and, and is one of the things that won the uh, the game for you guys when we played Super. Yep. So yeah, um, Pyro, any any real questions about the game right now? Um, nope. I just have one comment that I think every time I play, I'm going to call potions food instead of potions, so I can pretend I'm playing Gauntlet. You know, I think that's a fair decision. Rex looks Why like not? he's trying to shake your hand. It's like, shake, shake, shake. Yay, Rex. Actually, I think that's him trying to use the Rex Cuddle ability. Is that actually an ability? Yes. Yes. It squishes you. Rex has an He hugs you and squeezes you and calls you George. Yeah, Rex has an ability where he grabs a character and makes them weak and unable to move for a turn by holding them. That is pretty funny. 
Uh, one of the cool features I really like is that they took a cue from World of Warcraft, and uh, the Dragon Starfire has this thing called Timeout Mode, where once the dragon reaches half health, it immediately interrupts whatever else is going on, teleports away, it leaves to a different room, sets everything on fire, and then spawns uh, a little group of minions where it was. So it's kind of like a Nixia. And then you have to fight the ads. It's like a Nixia flying away. I actually think that's it's really cool and flavorful for the game. Just to fight the ads and then chase the boss back down. So yeah, I, I have been nothing but impressed with Super Dungeon Explorer. Um, admitted, the rulebook is the one thing I don't rule like about this. The rulebook sucks. I'm just saying. <laughs> You'll probably need extra help to figure out the game. But as far as, like, the miniatures that come in the box, this is a fantastic deal. $90 for 50-plus miniatures plus the game itself. And from what it looks like, they are just going to keep expanding this game. Well, let me pull up some images. Which is good, because running the same theme dungeon over and over again could get kind of boring, because it's basically all, like, fire and lava from these tiles. $90 and some substantial construction time isn't quite for the faint of heart, though, so you, yeah, no, you have to have you, you some really idea have of what you're, what you're getting, getting into. into. It, it, it is a serious deal that these models don't come assembled, and for someone who is not used to building these, it might be a little tough. Like, I was using all of my model building skills to get these together. Mm -hmm. And a Starfire especially, who comes completely disassembled, um, the base is two pieces, each leg and arm is not attached, the wings aren't attached, the head isn't attached, and the tongue isn't attached. Do you had to attach the tongue? Yeah, the tongue had to be inserted into the mouth. Um, it's a hard model to build. Like, like, really. Okay, so I actually pulled up the images, and I'll link these in chat. These are from the WAMP forum. Someone posted the leaked images of the proposed expansion for Super Dungeon Explorer that is apparently being worked on right now. The... Uh, Mario Brothers expansion. So the first character that we have shown is the Dwarf Spelunker, who looks like Mario from the Donkey Kong games. It's a dwarf with a really big hammer. And no doubt the princess addition to the game. Aww. And then the the Turtle Troopers and the Turtle Bombardier are the, the main enemies that seem to be added. They're, they're also looking to add the, the much-needed gel enemies that are in every single dungeon-crawling game that most people have found appalling that they weren't included in the base set for Super Dungeon Explorer. Um, your enemies in, in Super Dungeon are Dragonlings and Kobolds. Which actually make really good enemies. Like, I, I love how the enemies work in this game. I think they're all really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I think the only real flaw I can see with this game is it, it could potentially become really stale if they don't keep on with the expansions. But the way the game is built, I don't think it would be too hard for them to, to keep it up, to do a release at least two also, or three times a year. Also, there are tons of tokens. Yeah, it comes with a uh, three sheets worth of tokens that represent everything in the game. I was trying to find the baby dragons. Oh, the, the whelps? Hold on. They're being all cute. Everyone ends up sitting yeah. in the same pile. Oh, well, where are you at? Maybe those did get packed up. There should be two of them. Is he like a little one. one. It is. Yeah. It's so many others. Pixie has mad yeah. love for the little dragon whelps. They're so cute! I can't wait to paint those. Can I paint white armor on a paladin? No. Can I paint little dragons? Yes. Totally equipped for that. But yeah. So that is Super Dungeon Explorer. And yeah, uh, Tall, what you said in chat? Totally valid. You can pretend this is basically Dragon Quest, the board game, and you won't be far off. They are just super cute, super deformed models that are absolutely adorable when painted. Like, I I know I didn't do the best job painting our paladin, but I still love seeing him on the board every time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Very chibi. Totally chibi. And I think the game will be much more enjoyable once all of the models are done. Mm -hmm. It'll take you a while, though. Maybe. We can seem to do one in about three hours. Uh. Of decent level painting. Plus, oh. 
the, one of the advantages is everyone looks at these models and my painter friends are all like, oh my god, can I paint this one? Yes. Yes, you can. And then it's like, less work for us. If I remember correctly, Brad totally wanted to try to paint the bear, and I'm tempted to let him. Yeah. Why not? It's a model I don't have to paint. <laughs> Just right. follow what's on the box and we're good. Yeah, but it's a white bear on the box. That will be a white bear when it's done, because the druid's hair is supposed to be white. Mm. Like, everything from, from the druid miniature transfers onto the bear. I see. Well, if it's white, at least it won't look like Tibbers. You know, I could paint him like Tibbers. And then everyone will go, bear! When he comes out of the Hate that bear. Everyone hates that bear. So much hate for that bear. But then we would so, have to paint the druid to look like Annie. That's funny. That's that's tempting. So yeah. Um, well, oh man, we could totally make all these League of Legends themed. I'd have, have to, already started. I'd have to repaint the paladin as Leona. That, that is really tempting. Um, so yeah, I guess that's a natural segue for us to move on to <gasps> League of Legends. Limitless. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess League of Legends is a natural segue, and Limitless is a completely unnatural segue. We, we really but I'm going only... to do Limitless instead. Okay. I can put League of Legends at the end. Okay. League talk at the end. Limitless was directed by a guy named Neil Berger, which I think is pretty funny because his last name is Berger. It's like, hey, it's a hamburger. Yeah, I noticed that too when I saw the opening credits. It is a suspense thriller about a pill that makes people smart, but then it kills them. Yeah. And so the main character gets smart, and he has to use his smarts to avoid being killed. And it's yeah. a, a serviceable suspense thriller. The main problem, and it's one you pretty much expect going in from the plot summary, is that people who are supposed to be really, really smart kind of do some pretty dumb things on a regular basis. Hey, so like, important. not realize they're going to run out of smart pills. Important information you might be interested in. Um, Neil Berger is actually set to direct the Uncharted Drake's Fortune movie. Huh. Well, this Limitless is good enough that that does not make me worried about the Uncharted movie. Of course. Uh... I'm not sure there has been a good video game movie yet, so not too much hope. But yeah. maybe. Well, Bruce Campbell is going to star in the Uncharted movie? <laughs> That's we are pretty all funny. about wikiing this. It's, it's Ash from Evil Dead. He's just going to have a shotgun. Yep. But um, yeah. So yeah, I, I watched Limitless a couple weeks ago, and my big problem with the movie was... It, it seemed to just compound problems so quickly that it you never felt like there was resolution to anything going on. Like, that that was my absolute biggest issue, that, yeah, the story's progressing, yeah, he's a genius now, and, wait, now he's getting drug. Now, for some reason, he's connecting with his ex-girlfriend, who is totally okay with this. Oh, wait, now she's not okay with this. Um, now this guy that he borrowed money from is addicted to the drug and wants more of it and it decides to kill him now which totally solves the problem of where does he get more of this magical drug they did pile on villains one after another because it was yeah. like there was one villain and then another and another and another and then at the very end like in the last five minutes of the movie there's a new villain and then there's not a new villain anymore yeah so one thing I thought was hilarious is that a bunch of the people who take the smart drug have really blue eyes. And so this can only lead me to conclude that the smart drug is Spice from Dune. Probably. That's actually what it is. Except it does the opposite of Spice in that it kills them. Um, I, I will say, I really like Limitless's uh, direction style. I thought it was really cool. Uh, the, the, the streaming street scenes that they do whenever the drug <laughs> takes effect of him... Get, got a little annoying the third time they did it. Yeah, it was like, this is pretty cool the first time, and then they went on to do it again and again and again, and then it's like, yeah, I've, I, I, I've just spent, you know, ten minutes watching endless rack zooms down a street. I, I, I get it that they're trying to show that he's spiraling out of control and can't tell where he's going anymore, but it, it gets really, really annoying. Man, Wikipedia just has, like, a scene-for-scene -scene summary of the movie. 
Like, I thought Wikipedia avoided that, mostly. So, since it's old, I don't figure we need to talk about it too much, but... Yeah, my, my... I mean, Bradley Cooper is really, really good in this movie. He, he does an awesome job playing it out. The scenes are really cool. The writing is ridiculously good for Eddie's inner monologue. I absolutely love all of those scenes. He is handsome, and so is Robert De Niro. So, it's a pretty handsome movie. Yeah, Robert De Niro makes a great frenemy in this movie. So yeah, um, my, I, I my final we'll verdict is serviceable it, yeah. action thriller. Yeah, and it's it's free on Netflix. So like, what are you waiting for? If you have Netflix, why not? The the premise is really good. It's cool to see the effects when the drugs kick in because they actually do show that the entire shot gets brighter and little details come into focus. It's like they switched the entire lens. So yeah, that's Limitless, I guess. It was very enjoyable. Alright, on to the next topic then. We old Republic thought, achievements. Yep, we figured that with the Old Republic not having enough to do in it, we needed some achievements here. Also, we just felt like screwing around, and since we were playing the Old Republic basically all week, we decided to turn that into productive time. Unique content, right? Woo! I, I, I really feel... Like I'm missing out in a game when I'm not getting pointless rewards for pointless actions. And no, while that sounds not... sarcastic, it's actually pretty true. I kind of like achievements a lot. I think achievements. we've all been conditioned to like achievements, even when they're for things we were already doing anyway. Like, oh my god, like rewards you finished then. this area! Achievement! But, but there's I was actually gonna do that anyway. One extra element you can have to achievements that occur in the course of regular gameplay... And that's usually that they have amusing little names that are one-liners. And hey, everybody loves one-liners. Yeah, why my true. first proposed achievement is level hat for reaching the level cap. Because, you know, caps are a type of hat. It's, it's a hat for your levels. Level I see. Hat. I can go by that one. Man, with all the weird faces I'm making in today's show, Pyro, you're going to be able to make such a montage. The weird, weird face faces montage. montage. All right, then. Continuing. Um, okay, this one th uh, that you have at the top here isn't actually possible. But it could be possible if the game developers wanted to do it. It wouldn't be hard for them to add. Because as a, you can only use your class buff while targeting another player character. Yep. Um, his proposed achievement is Nerf Herder, from using and your class buff on X number of nerfs. There's a lot of gear you'll find throughout the game that is called Nerf Herder Gloves or Jacket or whatever. Yeah, it's the and lowest level of the gray items. It is an insult. Actually, there's there's Actually, a there's green a items Nerf that are named Nerf items. Herder stuff. Okay, then. For some reason. But it is also an insult, I, even from the first Star Wars movie, to call someone a Nerf Herder. Second Star Wars movie, actually. I, I think he meant first trilogy. Yes. L Leia called... Huh, and a scruffy-looking nerf herder. Yep. Which is... Man, I feel really sorry for the one guy in the Star Wars universe who's like, that for a job. <laughs> yeah, I love nerfs. It's just like, come on, somebody has to raise these space cows so that we can have space meat and space leather and space a milk. Actually, I thought of the... the a similar achievement to be called nerf herder. Play a class that gets nerfed at least five times. <laughs> okay, well that's actually also an awesome pun. I approve of that. Scaps for that. Because everyone would eventually earn that achievement just for playing long enough. Mm -hmm. They just credit your class each time they do a, a nerf on an ability, and eventually your class will reach five. So, I, I have two achievements for attacking yellow mobs throughout the world. There's, there's people, enemies, just out in the wilderness who won't enemies. attack you on sight. They're neutral. And so they're like, hey, I'm just doing my thing. I don't, I'm don't. i not here looking for trouble. But you can attack them, and then they'll fight back. And so I have one for doing that, which I've called Troublemaker, just because you're a jerk. And then I have one that I think is much better and would have a much <laughs> larger gamer score reward if there were gamer the, scores. Which is the basically the Fight Club assignment. Pick a fight with a neutral mob and lose. <laughs> it's called... Like, was that wise... But you yeah. have you have to be dumb. You're like, yeah, I think I can take this chump, and then you punch it in the face, and then it eats your head. 
And you're like, oh no, my head. See, I could actually see that being like a comfort achievement for the person who does that and then gets the little text that pops up at the bottom of the window that just says, was that wise? Like it's it's a consolation by the game award. <clears throat> yeah, I could see yeah, that. And then you can imagine like the people who are going to go out and try and get that, like the stood in the fire thing and wow. And the game is still calling them dumb for it because they hurt their gear. Okay, so continuing. There are a couple of reused lines of dialogue um, for certain classes. To, to, I've, I've noticed that when I pick certain options, that it'll be a reusing a particular line for my character. For example, my Sith Inquisitor will often say, There will be no survivors. Yeah, my guy keeps saying count on it, like it's his catchphrase. Yeah. And they kind of neatly disguise it where they're, they're, the characters are using catchphrases. But actually, I'm pretty confident it's just like, hey, here's an excuse that we don't have to record more assets. Yeah, because basically. we have to pay the voice actors for that. And well, so we decided let's face it, Pixie's character kills everyone a lot. <clears throat> Only most of them. Hey, I didn't kill that one guy. No, because it was more evil to take him with us. Anyway. So we've decided to use those catchphrases as names for achievements. So there will be no survivors you would get for soloing a four-man heroic. Likewise, I actually made one for count on it, blindly accept five quests at one time. <laughs> Just be like, I'll uh, do it. I don't even know if you can do that, because... You have to listen to them tell you about it. Actually, no, you if, you if there was the a space bounty bar. board that had five quests on it, but I've never seen one that has that many. Yeah, uh, they're all, always one at a time, but, like, my options at the end of the conversation tree is always blindly agree to accept this, ask for more details, or refuse. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I figured the count on it achievement would just be, you pick the top option five times and just go for it without ever asking for more information. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll do it! You are the worst Sith ever. I, I just want to get a Sith companion who looks at my character and goes, why are you helping people? You've inspired me to add an achievement to my list, which I'm going to call I Don't Cash My Checks, which is for not accepting your quest rewards, because there's a, there's a mechanic in the Old Republic where if your inventory is full or you're just doing something else, you can succeed in a quest and there'll be a little window that pops up with the items you get and the credits and experience you get, but you can just ignore them forever and accumulate like five or ten quest rewards. You it'll just have it accepted. Thing. Like, nah, all I have to do to get that experience is click a button, but I'm too lazy for it. Oh, yes. An achievement for accumulating five of those. Darn, I had that one, too. It was called Get in Line. Because <laughs> I had my, uh... At one point, my inventory was completely full of green items, so I couldn't vendor trash any of them. And I kept sending my companions out on fetch quests to go get stuff for me. And they would come back and they're like... Perfection is overrated, or you should thank me, and it's just like, pending. I will get to your stuff in a few minutes. <clears throat> so, alright, continue. This is kind of a silly one. We had, we had mentioned how a uh, few half-naked Twi'leks we had seen dancing on top of a mailbox, so we thought we would encourage it with the use of an achievement. It's called The Goldshire. Where you dance naked on top of a mailbox. <laughs> in one of the major cities. As is, of course, an MMO tradition. You know, I, ironically, the last bar that I walked into on Tatooine had the half-naked toilet girl standing on the ground level cheering at the fully-dressed fat guy who was standing <laughs> on top of the bar. <laughs> I, I think he just had too much to drink and uh, the other people were egging him The, twi the toilet was just like, I'll take a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. continue. Either it's repeat. All right, second verse, same as the first, for, for repeating a repeatable quest. Kind of a common thing in these games, especially in Star Wars, where you can redo any of the heroics every day. Mm. <clears throat> this, Without the, any the title of that achievement is a reference to the song Henry VIII by... I can't remember the name of the group that did it. Ah! Uh, I know which one! Hey, guys, we have Google right in front of us. I'm thinking, like, the Turtles. da da, -da. It's Herman's uh, Hermits. Herman's Hermits. There we go. I don't know where you got turtles out of that. Yeah, I don't know. I knew something. it was an H, but... Continuing down our list of insanity. 
All right, so these were fun. Okay, so when you're in a multiplayer conversation, there are little rolls in the background or it comes up with a number, and that basically determines which one of you gets to, to give a given line of dialogue. And sometimes the actual numbers that are used for these roles are completely insane. Because like, you can critical on them, basically. Usually they're between 1 and 100, but sometimes they go really large, like 500 or more. And I figure, hey, why not have an achievement for that? But you can beat down your friends and be like, shut up, it's my turn to talk. By rolling 500 or more in a, uh, in a conversation roll. Yep. Of course, there's also the opposite side of that, where you roll a natural one, and you're like, oh, I'll shut up now. The, um, never mind. That works. Alright, continuing. So, of course, in an MMO, you're going to be spending your money often, especially when you hit level 25 in this one, because you need to basically bankrupt yourself to be able to ride a speeder. Unless you have slicing! Slice? Okay, actual word of advice for anybody who's going to play the Old Republic. You cannot survive without slicing. Dump dump some skill and get slicing, because you need it. So, yeah, basically, just slicing all day, every Free day. Free money forever. So, yeah, um, the achievement we created was for... Spending yourself down to zero credits after having at least 10,000. I got to do this one! I've done that. I've done it from 50,000. Because that's what happens when you get speeder training. It, yep. cost, it costs 40,000 and then 8,000 for the actual speeder. Not to you mention that, like, buying your class skills at that level is at least 1,000 per. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this would be the rise and fall of the rich man empire. It is, it is slightly more complicated than it seems, though, because the achievement is for getting to exactly zero credits. Getting down to four credits won't cut it. Or maybe right. you'll have to, to fly your spaceship back and forth between Dromund Cass and the Imperial Fleet, because it's like two credits per flight. Uh, well, I mean, I'd spend myself down to three, but... Alright, so next up we have the the kind of basic that belong in any game, the explorer achievement for going and filling in the entire map on a planet. People are already doing this just for the experience, but that was one of the things I liked in WoW. I liked just flying around an area and seeing all the places and getting the achievement for completing Except it. Tatooine, it all looks the freaking same. It's there desert. actually is kind of a nice reward mechanic for that in the Old Republic, because the map is made up of these hexagons, and then once you've actually gotten all of the designated areas, all of the gray and unavailable hexagons that you can't actually get to because they're mountains or bottomless pits or whatever, will fill in once you've um, seen all of the explorable areas. Well, that's a nice little bonus that's already in there. Alright. Alright, and then of course there's the completionist for completing all the bonus series on all the planets. Good the bonus out. series is a set of uh, long and fairly well-written set of quests that are available when you finish your class quest on the planet, and they give them to you in the spaceport as you're trying to leave. So it's like, all right, well, I'm done with this stupid planet. I'm going to get away. And then and they're then like, hey, like, there's these really well-written quests that have good rewards if you stay. And you're like, dang it. Yeah. My, uh, my character got some planetary governor nookie for staying. On Balmora, which no one ever wants to stay on. Everyone hates Balmora so much. I, I don't know anybody who was like, yeah, Balmora was so much fun. Gonna go to a blown out war zone wasteland. I, I with was, giant evil insects. I was not a fan of Balmora. So, continuing, um, we also have created the Galaxy Trotter achievement. And by we, we mean Pyro. Yeah, I got my own list. And that is for getting the Explorer achievement on every planet. So, this this is maybe is the, very hard and a level 50 type achievement because you will have to explore some cross-faction areas to get this. Mm -hmm. Alright, continuing. There's the Sexy Times achievement for um, pursuing a romance with a companion. <laughs> Which... 
when you do that, the way that the game handles it is that there's just, it fades to black, and then you exit the cutscene in your quarters next to your bed. Which I thought was amusing. Yep. Uh, there's the posse achievement for getting all five companions. Very important thing for most players. Yep. Gotta have your homies. Yep. Altaholics Anonymous for when you can't decide which character you want to play. That's for rolling a character in each of the class archetypes in either faction and getting to your ship. And then I have a double version called Relapse, wherein you roll all eight classes, even though they're practically doubles of each. So there's only four real classes. Yep. But if you're cross-faction and you're really big into rolling alternate characters, you can be an addict and get an achievement for it. All right. Uh, we also did a couple that were based on some of the other catchphrases of our characters. I, I think you want to do Bellilies first. <laughs> we just have to settle up and we're done. And that is for getting, say, 100,000 credits. Some big number. And then that's murder the and mayhem awaits. Okay. For my Inquisitor. For reaching the maximum level of Dark Side? Yep. Okay. On that same line, I created the one with the Force for achieving the ultimate light side. And in a quote from Futurama, a heart full of neutrality for finishing the game at neither light or dark side. Tier 1. That's, that's pretty hardcore. True you have to be dedicated to neutrality to do that one. Mm. Actually, have... I'm not even sure it's possible, because your class quests have um, either-or options all the time that are light and dark, and there's no, there's no neutral option. See, now we're seeing how hard it is to stay neutral in the Old Republic. Although, I, th I think that the game is funny how it displays it, because it displays your accumulated light points and your accumulated dark points, but there is an average of them. So you could get dark side points to equal out all your light side points and stay neutral. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just be like, go kick a few puppies, you'll be back home. Okay, so I've been thinking of PvP-related achievements, too. Mm -hmm. So I've got the achievement for when you initiate the fight with the first hit and end the fight. That would be the shot first achievement. I've got the achievement for wearing a 50-plus disparity between your lowest uh, your lowest equipment score on an item and your highest scored item. That would be the scruffy-looking achievement. <laughs> for not maintaining your equipment well. Yep. I've got the achievement for playing a PvP match in which the game went insanely long and you lost, which would be the should have let the Wookiee win. And the achievement for playing an insanely long game and winning, which would be the... Um, wow, I can't remember the pun for this one. Oh, the... Uh, the Force is with you. Didn't you already use that? Nope, I used one with the Force for the ah. light side achievement. Very good. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that achievements aren't just pointless rewards for pointless actions. They're the reward of a one-liner for a pointless action. Yes. The one-liner pun is usually totally worth it. Studio cat! And there's a studio cat. <laughs> studio cat strikes with a vengeance! So yes, those are just some ideas, and I'm sure Bioware will get around to making in-game achievements when, when the fervor to just play the game dies down a bit. Mm-hmm. They are no doubt coming eventually. There, There is no way to avoid them. There are too many good Star Wars puns to miss. Actually, I did have one more. Um, the achievement for finishing a PvP match that you looked like you were going to win, like say there, there's a disparity in the winning points of like 25 where it was down to the wire, that would be the no achievement. <laughs> Because you can't give it for murdering your significant other. That we know of yet. Yeah, that might come into the game at some point. <laughs> I don't know everyone's class quest, you never know. You might in fact strangle your pregnant significant other at some point. Oh, Lucas, you're so dark. Or just weird. I, I, also, I also thought of the achievement for 
what if you actually got all of the lore entries for every planet? Mm -hmm. That would be the, what's a midichlorian achievement? It's also for obsessive exploration and spending hundreds of hours in the game. Mm -hmm. Cool. You had things you wanted to say about League of Legends? Just one, actually. Um, so I don't think we managed to cover him fully in the last podcast that we did. Uh, but Victor has been released. Uh, he came out last Friday. And I've uh, gotten to do some playing of Victor, who is by far one of the weirdest champs in the game. Is he a robot? Yes. Uh, cyborg, technically. He is a he's the scientist who designed Blitzcrank. And in his frustration of having someone else steal the credit for making Blitzcrank... He went crazy and decided to upgrade himself because that way no one could take credit for making him. Makes sense. Right. So, Victor is just... he He's a character who hits ridiculously hard. He's an, an AP champion, a spellcaster, whose entire goal is based on the utility of his one item that he gets to start the game with. So he starts the game with this thing called a hex core that gives him three ability points per level which is kind of a bad item. You wouldn't want that late game. But what it does is, by spending 1,200 gold, you can upgrade the hex core into not only additional stats based on which one you pick, but into upgrading one of your abilities based on which version you pick. So the most common one the game rec recommends is the Augment Death, which gives you an additional 45 ability points in addition to the three per level that you are already getting. And then it upgrades your Death Ray ability, which is his weirdest power, to actually do a 30% additional damage over time when your Death Ray hits. Um, Victor's a weird character in that everything he does is just basically a hard-hitting damage ability, except for his Gravity Field, which is a slow and a hold. Um, really, that's all you need to do. If you can, yeah, if no, you can he, slow and hold and then damage. He has can... he has some of the highest scaling on his abilities that I've ever seen. He's like at 0.9% uh, ability points per item. So if you stack 100 ability points on him, you're going to actually get 90 of those transferred into your abilities, which is a lot better than Ari, who has like 0.3 on her abilities, but makes up for it in the fact that each of her abilities hits multiple times. So yeah, Victor is interesting. He's definitely hard to play because it takes a lot of getting used to to use his uh, Death Ray ability. And his ult needs some improvement. Like, it, it's good. It's good in a team fight, But it's not fantastic. Uh, basically, he drops this cloud on the ground that while the opponents stand in it, they'll take continuous damage every second. Uh, not a lot, but, but substantial over time. It silences them for a second after it drops on them. And if they walk into it, but it doesn't keep them silenced while they're in it. And Victor is actually able to move it. You can tap the button for the ability and then click again, and the ability will move to that point. So it's actually really great if your opponent is, like, running to a tower or something. Pretty it's, cool. It's interesting. I just wish it does more damage. So he, he's definitely a cool champion. I wouldn't say run out and buy him now if you have League of Legends. He's one that you really should wait till he's free, decide if you like him, and pick him up. Um... I've been practicing him nonstop, so I've finally gotten to the point where I feel confident with him. But yeah, that that is the newest champion. We have yet to see an announcement for the next one. They're, they're, they accidentally leaked Victor, so I think they're being a little caref uh, more careful now. So yeah, uh, I think that's about all we've got for this evening. So yeah, we definitely filled time. Yep. I, I gotta say, this week's uh, three champion rotation is crazy. So, what are we going to review for next week? Whatever is available, because nothing has come out, and I think we're going to have to go back into the released and we didn't grab it pile. But Christmas has continued to clear the area of new releases, and so nothing new is out. Nothing. I did notice that at the end of the month, uh, Final Fantasy XIII 2 comes out. Ooh. No. <laughs> Wait, let, me, let me say it again. No. <laughs> and one more time. No. We're going to contract out that one. <laughs> like the boss fights in Human Revolution? Yep. And it's going to be great. When the review comes back less than satisfactory, we can blame them. Can just put it in the game anyway and not have to be held accountable for it. Nope, not happening. Anyway. Anyway. 
This has been a fine nerd talk for Tuesday, January 3rd, 2012. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosim. And we'll catch you next week on Nerd Talk. And we're done. Say like. YouTube, like us. Subscribe. Do we have a subscribe? We yes. have a subscribe. <laughs>